What's up, guys? Today we're going over ESTIM. So pretty much all of the like basics of like the, you know the sciencey part of ESTIM. And over the next couple of weeks or so, I'll go into the different types of ESTIM like NMES, IFC, premod, iontophoresis. But this is just kind of an overview of ESTIM, going over precautions, contraindications. Why would we use it? What are the waveforms? You know the fun, exciting physics side of things. So let's get into it. So uses of electrical stimulation. So there's a bunch of different things we can use e-stim for. And a lot of times when we think of e-stim, we think IFC on the low back, um, but there's so much more than that. And so I'm just going to kind of give us an overview of what we would use different things for. So we can use it for our muscle strengthening. So that's like high volt and rush in to just kind of facilitate muscle movement and, you know, improve the ability of the muscle to fire. We can also use it for pain management. So this is what we're most familiar with. So IFC, so interferential current, pre-mod and TENS are all used for pain management. Muscle re-education, so neuromuscular electrical stimulation. So that's NMES. And then just in general stimulation of de-innervated muscles, we can use either a, pretty much a plethora of different options for that, just to be able to, you know, help with sensation, help for nerve firing and everything like that. So just kind of making sure that we're using ESTEM appropriately. So why would we use ESTEM? So pain management muscle atrophy, muscle spasms, any sort of neuropathies, so especially like foot drop with our patients who might've been like in the hospital or something or had a stroke, um, wound healing for ulcers. So you can actually use high volt and place the uh, electrodes right around the wound and just run some high volt through them. It's pretty cool. I've actually seen it before. Um, muscle weakness in general. So kind of same along the sides of like atrophy and stuff like that. Stress incontinence. So remember stress incontinence is where the, um, we're voiding urine involuntarily with an increase and intra-abdominal pressure. So essentially we can use East End to help facilitate the pelvic floor muscles to help contract appropriately. So then we're not accidentally voiding urine. So we would not want to use this with somebody who has a hypertonic pelvic floor, only hypotonic pelvic floor. Um, joint effusion. So just like if we're seeing like edema and stuff in the area, we can actually use high volt, like pretty much immediately and an acute injury to help with some of that edema. Um, and then fractures in general, just to work with pain management and stuff like that and facilitating wound healing. So lots of things we can use ESTEM for. Um, contraindications though for ESTEM. So I would say, because remember the boards is a safety test. We're very much concerned with this page. So if you want to just take this page and that's it and not pay attention to the rest of this or not do anything else, you'd probably be somewhat okay, but it's good to have a good overview of ESTEM. But here is the most important step. Contraindications to using electrical stimulation. This is any type of, of electrical stimulation. Cancer, malignancies. And this is because we're not, we haven't tested people who have cancer to see if the ESTEM will make it worse. So we're not going to try. And the thought process behind this is that if we put ESTEM on somebody who has a malignancy, that that would increase blood flow to the area and therefore increase their chance of metastases. So we don't want to put this on anybody who has cancer. Osteomyelitis. So again, same kind of thing, thinking of increasing blood flow, which would increase like, you know, the chance of somebody becoming septic. So we don't want to do that. Any sort of cardiac arrhythmia. So remember the cardiac system is controlled by, you know, electrical impulses and stuff coming from the SA node, the pacemaker of the heart. And so if we're putting any sort of ESIM on somebody and introducing extra electrical stimulation and electrical current to the body that might throw off any sort of arrhythmias they already have. So maybe they have like um, AFib or something like that. We don't want to mess that up anymore. Again, same thing with pacemakers. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. We already got a pacemaker working on putting out the appropriate amounts of uh, electrical impulses to the heart. So we don't want to throw more things in there and make it go bad. So no pacemaker. Yeah. So over the carotid sinuses, that's another one. So again, we don't want to see any risk of electrical stimulation going into parts of the body where that shouldn't be causing problems and confusing the body. So again, over carotid sinus is not a good idea. So don't do that. Any sort of phlebitis. So this is any sort of um, inflammation of the veins or anything like that. So we don't want any sort of um, thrombus is in there. So thrombophlebitis as well. So we just don't want to be increasing the risk of anything spasming 
Uh, so if we see that this patient has phlebitis, we're not giving them electrical stimulation um, over top of a pregnant uterus. And this is just because we haven't tested it over the pregnant uterus and we don't want to injure the fetus somehow. So we don't know what it'll do. So let's just not do it. So that's one of the other. That's why same kind of thing along with cancer with pregnancy and then any sort of seizure disorders. So remember, seizures are caused by electrical impulses in the brain going awry. So same kind of thought process as when somebody has a cardiac arrhythmia, essentially I think seizures are like an arrhythmia in the brain sort of thing. So um, we don't want to be introducing extra electrical stimulation to somebody who might have a seizure because that could accidentally trigger a seizure and we don't want that. So these are the contraindications. So how does electrical stimulation work? So if we kind of think back to our basics of anatomy, physiology, physics, all that fun stuff. What it's going to do is when we introduce an electrical current to the body, we are, we are giving a simulation of an electrical impulse that is greater than the resting potential of the nerve membranes, causing the nerve to be depolarized. So remember that the resting potential of most of the membranes of our nerves is about negative 70 millivolts or like microvolts, something like that. But what essentially what's happening is we're giving them an impulse that's greater than that number, which causes a depolarization, which causes the action potential. So remember the action potential is where all the gates are opening. There's an exchange of sodium and potassium, and then that causes a nerve impulse to be generated along Along the axon. So essentially we are saying, Hey, move to the nerve. And that's how it works. So here's some common terms that are associated with electrical simulation. So we have current. So that's how uh, the flow is directed from one area to another. So it'll just pass along. So down the axon, the current kind of flows down the axon. Um, voltage is a measure of electrical potential. So that's essentially how much is there going to be likely for the charges to move from one place to another. So the higher the voltage, the more likely charge is to be able to flow. Kind of same thing as if we're dropping a ball from a large, from off a window or some out of a window or something. There's a high potential for the ball to be carried to the ground with a lot of energy through gravity. Same kind of thing with voltage. Resistance is the ability of a material to resist the flow of electrons. So the higher the resistance, the less flow we're gonna have. And so this is associated with Ohm's law. So this is resistance. Uh, equals uh, voltage divided by current. Current sometimes is indicated as an I instead. So that is what we're looking at when it comes to a lot of things when it comes to electrical stimulation. So that was fun. Um, let's go into the types of currents that we actually care about. So direct current, this is one of the most common types of currents. So this is electrons are constantly flowing from the anode, which is the positive electrode, to the cathode, which is the negative electrode. So for at least one second. That's what's considered a direct current. It has to last at least one second. This is also called galvanic current. And this is used with iontophoresis. So if you see this picture here, it's just, it's all on the positive side and it's just flowing along. It's uninterrupted and it's, it's going along. So direct current is just one side. So it's either positive or negative and it's continuous and it doesn't stop. So continuous flow of electrons from the anode to the cathode. And again, this is how we use iontophoresis because essentially we're pushing all of the medication and the ions through from, let's say it's the positive electrode to the negative electrode. Alternating current. So this is more commonly used with IFC and pre-mod and as well as TENS unit. Um, and so this is going to be the current is constantly changing between positive and negative. A lot of times it shows up as a sinusoidal wave sort of thing. So it'll go up and then down and up and down and up and down and up and down. This is just the, the current is constantly changing direction, changing between positive and negative. And that is how we end up getting that tingly kind of sensation when it comes to IFC and Premon and TENS rather than just a sting straight through. That is the... Um, direct current. So alternating IFC, premod, and TENS. Pulsatile current. So this is just saying, is it just coming out in little bursts or pulses essentially? So this could be direct or alternating. So as we said before, you could have a pulse direct current. So that's kind of like, you know, just it keeps going in one direction for at least a second, constant flow. And then alternating would be, it's positive, then negative, then positive and negative. It could be monophasic or biphasic. So monophasic is just straight on through, just one phase, that's all we see, same kind of thing as ionto. And then biphasic is where we go positive, negative, positive, negative, and then 
pulsing through kind of thing. So waveform can either be positive or negative. Speaking of waveforms, here we have some waveforms on here. I had to make some drawings because I couldn't find some of them, but we have a bunch of different ways we would see waveforms kind of show up. So just when you see something like that, you're kind of understanding, okay, that's a waveform. It's measuring electrical, um, like uh, that's measuring the electrical like current coming out of it. So a sinusoidal wave is just like the rolling hills up and down. Squares just, you see like, I think like a, a row of buildings that are all like gentrified and all exactly the same. Like I think just like buildings. So squares, just uh, buildings kind of thing. Triangular is just like pyramids looking kind of thing. Sawtooth is like, a, it kind of, it's like ramps, ramps stacked next to each other. So it's up then straight down, then up, then straight down, then up, then straight down, or it could be straight down, then up and whatever. And these can also show up either positive or negative. Um, the one I have here on the bottom left, this is what you would consider a spike kind of waveform. So a spike waveform is commonly seen if we're going to have like a quick up and a quick down kind of thing. So we would see this a lot. We could see this um, with like hearts, rhythms and stuff like that. It's used a lot with like ramping up quick on and off kind of things like with a Russian simulation and stuff like that. And then rectangular, I think it's just tall buildings. And again, these could be positive or negative. So I kind of showed these positive and negative. So there's lots of different types of waveforms. Um, electrode, so this is where like we're definitely more concerned about stuff. So the positive electrode is called the anode and then the negative electrode is called the cathode. So remember, with the smaller electrode, so you have a little small electrode, you'll have an increase in current density. So that means that there's a lot more current going in that like smaller area, like per cubic centimeter, essentially. And then the current flow is decreased because there's not as much room for it to go. So it's just going straight in very intensely. Um, larger electrodes, you'll have decreased current density, so less current passing through for per like square centimeter. And this is if you have both of these set up on like the same settings, you'll see these kind of things. And then the increased current flow, just cause there's more space for this, it to come out. So essentially what you need to know, and this is important for the boards is that there's an inverse relationship between the amount of current density and the size of the electrode. So the smaller the electrode, the more current density you're gonna have going into that. So the more intense it's going to feel if it's at the same setting. Now, a bigger electrode is kind of gonna disperse and spread out all of that current. So then it's not going to be as intense if you set it on the same setting. So that's kind of the important thing, understanding that the bigger the electrode, the less current density is going through it. And the smaller the electrode, the more current density is going through it. So it's just more, it's smaller, it's more intense, everything's more concentrated. It's larger, it's more spread out, it's not as intense. So think of it that way. Okay, electrode placement. So we can have a monopolar placement. So this means that there's only one active electrode. So this is like similar to where we have um, iontophoresis. So like one of them is the dispersive like electrode and then the other one is the active electrode. Usually the active electrode is gonna be a lot smaller kind of going on that principle that we need to have like a really intense current like density to get all of like, like with ionto the medication through. Then the dispersive is just a large one that's kind of set off to the side to just make sure that the person is grounded. Because if we only have one electrode, then it's going to, the person's not grounded. So then therefore it's going to like shock their entire body. So you need at least one electrode to kind of ground everything. And this is true with even like biofeedback and stuff. So you need at least always two electrodes, but the polarity might just be a monopolar sort of thing. So this monopolar kind of setup is gonna be used again for ionto. That was one of the ones we talked about. You can treat wounds with this as well just passing the current through and then with edema. So kind of like the high volt and stuff like that. So um, that's where we have monopolar kind of setup. I would say mostly monopolar is going to be associated with iontophoresis when it comes to like, you know, questions that might be asked. Um, bipolar setup is where you have two electrodes equal in size and both of these electrodes are active. So you're always going to have the two electrodes, but if only one's active, then that's monopolar. But if both are active, then you're going to have a bipolar kind of setup. Um, and so this is going to be used for like muscle weakness. So again, if we're wanting to facilitate muscle activation, so neuromuscular facilitation, we'll use that for um, like uh, Russian or something on the quad, NMES, something like that, just to help facilitate the use of the muscle. And again, since it's passing evenly and both, both um, electrodes are active, uh, they're equal in size and stuff like that. So it's that bipolar setup. We'll use it for muscle spasms and stuff to, you know, calm everything down, range of motion. So like, you know, like the IFC pre-mod kind of setup. And then again, as I talked before, the neuromuscular facilitation. So again, you th you're thinking to yourself, well, then I, what about like IFC? There's four things. Well, that's a quadrupolar setup. 
And that's just kind of its own like little thing. And then also with tens, it would be a quadrupolar setup as well. But same kind of rules apply for the quadrupolar as the bipolar kind of setup. They're all equal in size and they're used to treat like, you know, pain, muscle spasms, all of that stuff to help facilitate just like healing and just making sure that you're not in a lot of pain kind of thing, part of healing. So Here's just some general terminology when it comes to the actual like waveforms and like what things are talking about. And I've just broke it down to just very simple kind of definitions, but you can look up like very scientific ones if you would like, but this is just to help you get a good idea of what the boards is talking about. So amplitude is the magnitude of the current, which is just how high up does that peak go? So we're looking at waveforms. How high up is that peak going on a waveform? Um, rise time is going to be the time that it takes to get from zero, so baseline, all the way up to the peak amplitude. So that's like the up part of the ramp. And then the decay time is the going back down towards zero. So rise time is very similar to what we would consider like um, just the getting up to wherever we need to go. Uh, so phase duration. So this is the time it takes for one phase of a pulse. So how many seconds does it take to go through the phase. So this is for uh, monophasic. So that would be just like straight through the phase and pulse duration are exactly the same because it's only monophasic. So mono means one phase. So just kind of a little outlier to that rule there. Frequency is how many pulses are delivered per second. So this is something we need to be familiar with because this is what we measure in Hertz. So even if we're thinking of uh, electrical stimulation, like how many like bursts, pulses per second are happening um, that is measured in Hertz. So we would see that on like the machine is like 150, like megahertz or something like that. Like it's like insane because um, it's super fast. And then if we're thinking of like ultrasound, same kind of thing, how many like pulses or whatever per second, Hertz is the common measurement. And then usually these are going to be insanely high, like megahertz. Um, so the higher frequency means that more fibers are recruited. So the higher you turn it up, the more fibers are going to be activated, you know, depolarized because of the action potential. And then we're having more muscles, fibers being recruited. Current modulation is essentially, I'm going to change something on here. So I'm going to either change the amplitude, the duration, the frequency, whatnot of the current to modulate it. So modulate just means changing. So changing how the current is going to be directed into the body. And then ramp time is like similar to rise time. So if you want to set up a ramp time for a patient, because let's say you're doing like, I don't know, Russian on somebody and like you have like no ramp time, it's just going to be like on and you're going to be like, ah, like it's just going to go from zero to like 40 or whatever you have it set to in like a second. And then they're going to be like, ah, so you want at least like two to five seconds of ramping up time just to have the patient be a little bit more comfortable. And they might ask something like that, just kind of understand like what's important of ramp time to more like make the patient more comfortable. So they're able to like, see, okay, we're, go we're going, we're going kind of thing. So sample question, guys, a physical therapist assistant has elected to use iontophoresis on a patient diagnosed with Achilles tendon inflammation. What kind of current does iontophoresis use and how many electric electrodes should be placed on the patient one, alternating, one electrode. Two, direct, one electrode. Three, alternating, two electrodes. Or four, direct, two electrodes. So I'll give you guys a second to think about that. Again, it's asking what kind of current does Ionto use and how many electrodes should be placed on the patient. All right, guys. So the answer is direct two electrodes. So the fourth answer. So this is because we're using iontophoresis. So remember it's direct current or galvanic current. The board sometimes throws that in as just to trip you up, but this is a direct current because it's not going between negative and positive. It's either positive or negative and it's just going straight through. So iontophoresis is a direct current and it's probably the best example of a direct current. And again, we always need to make sure we have two electrodes on a person. So for somebody who is using iontophoresis, one of the electrodes will be active and that's where the medication is placed under and stuff like that. And then the other one will be the dispersive electrode. So there will always be electrodes on them. Now, if I wanted to say how many active electrodes are on this patient, that would be one, but it's how many electrodes in general. It's always two because you need the active and the dispersive regardless because we need to ground the patient because we're not electrocuting our patient. Anyways, I hope that that was helpful, guys. Please reach out to me if you have any questions whatsoever, and I will see you guys in the next one. Take care.